Hey, good afternoon. I hope you're having a super Saturday. We are starting our series tomorrow on Paul's two letters to the church at Thessalonica. We call them First and Second Thessalonians. Um, as I was, as I've been preparing for this series now over the past several months and thinking about how we're going to start off the series tomorrow, as if you've been following along with Westway, you know that our normal practice is to spend some time in the background and talking about context, and we're, and we're certainly going to do that. In fact, tomorrow, we're going to begin our time together in Acts chapter 17, where we see the founding of the church. But there's more information that starts a little bit earlier in the book of Acts, and as I was wrestling through and struggling through how I wanted to share all of this tomorrow, um, because we don't do 90-minute sermons yet, at Westway Christian Church. Um, I, I wish I would have thought of this a little bit earlier, um, but I wanted to just briefly, uh, hopefully in about 15 minutes, um, share with you some pre-context to the context of Paul's letters to the, to the Thessalonians, um, to the church at Thessalonica. So again, tomorrow we're going to start at Acts 17, but I actually want to go back a few chapters in the book of Acts and talk about pick up in Acts 15. So in Acts chapter 15, there's this big council that takes place. There's this big argument that's taking place in the city of Antioch about what people have to do to become Christians. So they go back to, from Antioch, they go back to Jerusalem and they have this big discussion about what it looks like for someone to convert to Christianity. What does a Gentile have to do if they want to be a true Christian? So they all get together. They all talk about it. You can read that in Acts 15. And then a letter is written. And what is supposed to happen, this letter is supposed to go back to the church at Antioch and sort of square everyone away on what they're going to do. But I want to pick up in, actually in Acts chapter 15 beginning at verse 36. So this is after what I just described to you. So in Acts 15, uh, beginning at verse 36, it says this. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously had preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. So Paul and Barnabas have been planting all of these churches. That was Paul, what we call Paul's first missionary journey. And after this situation in Antioch, what they're going to do is they're going to go back and they're going to revisit the churches that they had planted in all of the cities all along. That's verse 37. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. What I find really interesting about this particular uh, scene and what we're going to be talking about as we talk about First and Second Thessalonians, we're going to be talking about how Paul is writing this, church, this letter to the church in Thessalonica for them to be encouraged. Well, you may not know this, or maybe you've heard this, before, but the name Barnabas actually means sons of encouragement. So it's really kind of strange. We're getting ready to read this. Or we're getting ready to do this series and we're getting ready to read these two letters, um, sons of encouragement, and they get into this disagreement and they split. So Barnabas takes John Mark and Paul takes Silas uh, with him and they're going to go on this trek to visit the churches that they had planted. So let's pick up. We're just going we're going to read all of chapter 16 together. Uh, Paul first went first to Derby and then to Lystra where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer but his father was a Greek. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium, so Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. In deference to the Jews of the area, <clears throat> he arranged for Timothy to be circumcised before they left, for everyone knew that his father was Greek. Then they went from town to town, instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. That's at the beginning of chapter 15. 
So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. So remember, so Paul and Silas, they're on this tour of churches that he and Bar- Paul and Barnabas had planted. And along the way, they pick up this guy named Timothy, who is a young, young Christian. Um, and Zane, uh, I think well, actually it was Cody. Uh, Cody did a great job talking about this a few weeks ago. Um, Timothy, they picked up Timothy because he was well approved by all of the believers in the churches there in Derby and Lystra. Next, this is verse 6. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Fergia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. So their plan was to go visit all of these churches uh, that they had planted before. And these churches they had planted in Asia. So they wanted to go to Asia. But it says the Lord, the Holy Spirit had prevented them from doing that. Then coming to the borders of Mycenae, they headed north to the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Mycenae to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was sitting there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we, this is really awesome. This is one of my favorite texts in the entire book of, um, of Acts. Remember, Luke is the author of Acts. In every other chapter and every other verse up to this very point, in Acts chapter 16, Luke is describing what, uh, what, what others are doing. He's talking about all of the other people in second person or third person, and something amazing happens in um, in verse 9. We decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Don't miss that. Verse 8, they, so instead they went on to Mycenae to the seaport, but Paul had a vision, so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once. I love this so much because in this text, Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, the author of the, the book of Acts of the Apostles, um, Luke goes from uh, Luke goes from a newspaper reporter uh, to someone who's participating in the mission, and I just love it so much. <clears throat> so as Paul and Silas now are making this trek, they pick up Timothy, and now they pick up Luke. We there it is again. We boarded a, a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace, and the next day we la- landed at Neapolis. From there, we reached Philippi, a major city of that district in Macedonia, and a Roman colony, and we stayed there several days. On, that, on the Sabbath, we went a little way outside of the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer, and we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth and who worshiped God. And they listened to us. The Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized. So I'm going to say something just really quickly and then we're going to roll through this. Um, That word baptized there, uh, the Greek word means immersed. So they were immersed and she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And they... And they urged this, and she urged this until we agreed. One day, this is while they're still in Philippi. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are the servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Again, don't miss that. Luke is a part of the story. Okay? So there's this, they come across this slave girl who has this spirit that enables her to tell the future. And as Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke are walking through uh, on the way to the place of prayer, this girl is following behind them, really proclaiming the truth, right? These men are servants of the Most High God, and they've come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities in the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten and then were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make 
Sure, they didn't escape. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner flew off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We're all here. So this is, this is standard practice. If I'm, a, if I'm a jailer or my prisoners escape, I'm going to be punished. So it's just easier if I commit suicide. And what Paul says is, don't, don't kill yourself. We're here. We haven't gone anywhere. We're still here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in the household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately immersed. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said that you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. I love Paul so much for what he's about to do. <clears throat> but Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison. And we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave secretly. Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. So we're going over all of this because tomorrow we're going we're gonna to pick up at the beginning of Acts chapter 17. Right, and I'm just going to read Acts chapter 17, probably one, maybe maybe in the second verse or so. Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Ampilus, Ampiphilus, Ampiphilus, and Apollonia, and came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. So tomorrow, like we're going to ask this question, right? Like, like why? Like, how did they get there? Well, we have to remember that at the end of 15, Paul and Barnabas were going to go back and tour all of the, the churches and the towns where they had already set up churches and they were going to go and check on them. So one of Paul's things is to not just plant churches and not follow up. Like that's his, that's his goal is to follow up. He has this argument with Barnabas. Instead, he takes Silas with him. So then he goes, because this is what he's going to do. He's going to go check on these churches along the way. He picks up young Timothy. He picks up Luke. Only the Holy Spirit prevents him from going to Asia because God has a different plan for Paul. And God reveals this plan to Paul through the vision. The man from Macedonia and northern Greece sitting there pleading him with him, come to Macedonia and help us. Thessalonica is an important city in Thessalonica or in Macedonia. In fact, it's the most important city um, in Thessalonica. So what Paul is doing and how we get to Thessalonica at the beginning of Acts chapter 17 is Paul is obedient to God. There are people in Macedonia who don't know who Jesus is. There are people in Thessalonica who don't know who Jesus is. And God's plan is not for Paul in this moment to go back and check on all of his other churches, although that's important. God's plan for Paul is to go to Macedonia, to go to Thessalonica. And what's so fascinating about all of this is Paul's letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, scholars believe they're the earliest letters that are written. So at some point, it becomes not feasible for Paul to go back on a tour and see all of his churches, right? I mean, just geographically, there's so many, there's so much space. There's so many places where Paul has, um, has planted churches, where Paul and Barnabas planted churches. Paul and Silas are now going to plant churches. There are so many places 
where they have planted churches that it's not feasible for them to go and visit all of them, right? They don't have this kind of technology. They can't just hop on FaceTime. They can't just hop on Facebook and check in with them. So what Paul's going to do to care for his churches is he's going to think of a new way to care for his churches, and he's going to write them a letter. So tomorrow morning, we're going to pick up right here in Acts chapter 17, verse 1, talking about how, um, like now we're going to get into it tomorrow. How did the church at Thessalonica form? Um, now that Paul has, has, has gone through Philippi and he's on his way to Thessalonica, it's about a 70 mile journey. <clears throat> so when we read, when we go from, from chapter 16 to chapter 17, we think like Paul just walks across the bridge from Scotts Bluff into Gearing. Uh, it's going to take 70 miles. So Paul is going to walk. Um, with Silas, with Timothy, we can sort of assume that Luke is with them. In the midst of all of this, Paul's going to land in Thessalonica, and the first place he's going to go is to the Jewish synagogue. So that's it. Um, I hope you will join us tomorrow morning. We're going to pick up right here um, at 1015. You can join us live in person uh, at the Westway building here in, uh, or there, actually, I'm in Gearing. We're going to, you can join us live in Scotts Bluff at the Westway Building at 1015. Uh, you can also follow us on YouTube where we broadcast live that. Uh, that link is posted in the notes for this Facebook Live video. So I want to let you know I love you. I'm praying with you, praying for you. And I would love to see you tomorrow morning at 1015 as we pick up and we begin our study of First and Second Thessalonians together. That's it. Have a great rest of your Saturday. See ya.